The Juno World Affairs Council presents Arresting Climate Change, Transforming the World's Largest Industry with Bill Leedy. Leedy is an electrical engineer, businessman, and philanthropist. He has co-authored more than 20 research papers on renewable energy and alternatives to electricity. We've been operating steam engines like this for over 250 years, various kinds of them, and mostly on coal, some on wood. They're Carnot engines, they're heat engines, they're limited in their efficiency by the laws of physics that Carnot discovered a long time ago. We've been operating on oil and gas for only 150 years. We thought that there was going to be a peak oil, and there, probably, there will be a peak oil. We thought it was going to be a few years ago. It's been postponed a couple of decades by the fracking. There will be a peak natural gas, and there will be a peak coal, too. We just don't know when they are. So we stand, we stand at the very pinnacle of an interval of fossil fuel use between the first solar civilization and the second. This is the first solar civilization. It took about 25% of the sunlight falling on this to be harvested to run the tractors, the farm animals, the other 75% was used. So here's our history in the Industrial Revolution. Back in 1850, we emitted hardly any carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at all. We weren't using fossil fuels. And as we did, up past the year 2000, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere went up and so did the temperature. Are we putting too much CO2 too fast into the atmosphere and thereby inflicting a problem upon ourselves? The second civilization is going to be a collection of renewable energy sources, perhaps transmitted in a hydrogen pipeline to a destination community. These will be diverse renewable resources and of benign nature because they won't be carbon dioxide emitting. And many of them will be remote, so we'll have to have transmission lines in order to get them where we're going. Now, we just happen to have here a small, complete, renewable energy hydrogen system. Our artificial sun down here was producing photons, DC electricity, split the water molecule. This is just distilled water in here. And the hydrogen and oxygen gases, yes, there's hydrogen in the room and we're all safe, goes over to the fuel cell where it's converted back into DC electricity and does work, which is what we humans want. That's a form of work. Now you can see that the sun's gone down and we still are operating, so apparently we've invented perpetual motion here, so mark this day. <laughs> or you can place your bets. Maybe there's hydrogen storage, which is a very useful thing. Watch to see if that goes off. And this is how the fuel cell works. This is not a Carnot engine. This is an electrochemical engine. And this could be our energy future, where we feed hydrogen gas into a fuel cell, combine it with oxygen from the air, and work is done. We light a light bulb or something like that. And then, when we bring our renewable source energy to an urban setting via hydrogen or electricity pipelines, we can use it to fuel the cars, combine heat and power in the buildings. These electric motors are also not Carnot machines, but they run on electricity that's generated in Carnot plants, limited in efficiency depending on heat. We have to burn a fuel in order to make that. Now, if humanity's goal, no matter our religion or, or political persuasions, we can agree that this is what we want for our global energy economy of the future. Benign sources, no CO2 emissions, resilient, able to accept shocks that come down, the, down to us equitable, affordable, and perpetual. And the only way to do that is to transform the world's largest industry, which is now operating 85% on fossil, to 100% renewables, perhaps including some nuclear. It's very hard to predict what role nuclear will have. And this has to operate on every continent for all people. We can run the world on renewables. A very important paper by Jacobson and Delucci back in 2011 calculated that we can provide all the global energy, not just electricity, all energy with just wind, water, and solar power. They didn't even touch geothermal and didn't mention nuclear. So they have a plan to power 100% of the planet with renewables, and this was the title from Scientific American, Wind, Water, and Solar. This is the wind resource in the Great Plains of the US. <laughs> If we were to harvest the wind of just these 12 windy states, we would need 1,500 
hydrogen pipelines or about 3,000 electric lines to get it to market, but there's enough wind energy alone to run the whole country, not just electricity, all energy for all purposes for all people. Now, the American Wind Energy Association's goal is 20% of our electricity from the wind by 2030. A very ambitious goal, but that's only 7% of USA energy because electricity is only a third of our energy system. Fortunately, in this same area, there's three orders of magnitude, a thousand times more solar energy than there is wind energy. So if we combine the two, there's no question that we could run the whole country, all energy for all purposes, just on the wind and solar from the Great Plains. Climate change is our current vernacular for global warming, global climate change, greenhouse effect, we called it all these terms. It's really a much more complicated phenomenon. It's caused by the unrestrained combustion of fossil fuels, putting too much CO2 into the atmosphere, and there are other greenhouse gases as well for which we humans are responsible. So the eight dangers to Earth and life as we know it are rapid climate change, much more rapid than we've seen for hundreds of thousands of years, which then in turn will cause sea level rise, ocean acidification, species extinctions. These other effects all cascading down from having too much CO2 too fast into the atmosphere, and these are real costs. We don't pay the costs when we buy a gallon of gas at the pump, but these are real costs that we and our future generations are paying. How are we going to internalize them into the prices that we pay so we send a signal through the market system so that we do the right thing and transform the world's largest industry into benign sources? These eight dangers are compromising the ecosystem services that are worth trillions of dollars to us and also don't appear in the prices that we pay for things. Now, we're a bit stuck in our ways, and we think that this is the best of all possible worlds. We like Earth just the way it is. Millions of species, benign climate, sea level, just where it is. This is the best of all possible worlds, isn't it? Maybe a warmer world with higher sea level is going to be better. We may find out. The problem is that over the next 100 years, on the present course, the level of CO2 into the atmosphere, and thereby probably the Earth's temperature, is going to climb very rapidly. This is the famous hockey stick <laughs> uh, diagram that uh, everybody uses. So here's our incentive to run the world on renewables plus perhaps some nuclear. These problems have become emergencies and we need to act quickly. Fortunately, there's much more solar energy. The only income the planet has is radiant energy from the sun. We have more than enough to run the total world energy use for all seven billion of us at this time. And it manifests itself in wind and various other forms, as well as the radiant energy from the sun that we're now capturing with PV panels. And this is our heritage of capital, which we are now spending. So we need to make a decision. Decisio, Latin for cut away. We need to cut away spending our capital, including damaging the, the Earth's natural capital ability to deliver ec ecosystem services and decide that we're going to run the world on income. Now, geothermal is, is a little different. That's a form of capital that we may be able to access, but at least we know there's more than enough sunlight to run everything. When I moved to town in 71, this was the Mendenhall Glacier, that's me. This is it a couple of years ago. We're familiar with this. And many of us in this room are motivated by what we've seen happening in our state and in our backyard. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what to do about this. There we go. Tens of thousands of walrus came ashore for lack of ice and they trampled their young. Now, Maynard Miller, many years ago, said, it's about time for another ice age. So maybe we humans have been really lucky and put just the right amount, or maybe too much, CO2 into the atmosphere to prevent the next ice age. But we may have overdone it. We put too much CO2 into the atmosphere too fast. Now, there is a global warming pause, which has given critics of the whole phenomenon of climate change, some ammunition to say, see, the Earth hasn't really warmed for the last 18 years. Where's that, that 
thermal gain that you say we're harvesting unnecessarily from the sun. Well, it may be, have been in the deep ocean and it may have come to the surface in the blob. There's the thing that people are talking about now that's causing odd uh, fish to show up and birds to die. So by arrest, I mean to stop or check our rapid advance into climate change, curb and restrict and limit the way we are now using energy. Some are even talking about seizing by legal authority that climate change is a, cl is a crime against humanity. I don't know who you would arrest or under what authority, but that's an interesting concept, isn't it? So our goal here today is to understand as much as we can about the energy system and the climate effects that it has so that we feel empowered to f further our investigation. It's a very complicated topic. And then to decide what we're going to do in order to deal with this problem and then share what we've learned with others. And at least on our dying day, we'll be able to say, I knew and I tried. So we have several ways to respond. Mitigation means we're going to try to prevent or re reduce the effects of climate change. Adaptation means it's happening, we've got to adapt to it. We've got to build the dikes higher. We've got to raise different crops because you can't grow corn in the Midwest anymore. Geoengineering, if all else fails, why don't we put some mirrors in space or put some extra sulfate molecules in the upper atmosphere and reflect some more sunlight away. And finally, if you give up on all this, it's acquiescence. The milk is spilled. The CO2 is in the atmosphere. If humanity is extinct tomorrow, the planet will continue to warm, sea level will continue to rise. Nature rules, nothing we can do about it. The problem is too big. We, we have to have energy, I've got to drive to work. And it's too complicated, I can't help anyway. It's God's will or God is on our side, the species, you won't let us fail. And that results in denial. If we can get through denial, then on the other side awaits a moral solution to it. I think this is not a technical or an economic problem. It's primarily a moral problem, that we need to accept stewardship for life on the earth and, and uh, operate our own species accordingly. So denial has many aspects to it. It's not human caused. The response, if attempting to respond to it threatens me, the problem's too big. So we don't want to fall into this trap. We're all smart, well-educated people here. The Pentagon sees the trap, and they, in October 14, issued a report saying these are the aspects of security threat to us. Here are our responses to mitigating the effects of climate change. Efficiency is a technical term. It means how good the light bulbs are. It means how good your refrigerator and your car is. It's the way machinery works. Conservation is a lifestyle decision. It's your decision to ride the bike or buy the smaller car or the better refrigerator. And finally, transforming the energy industry is something that we can do via policy and via capital, by investing in new ways of doing things. To even begin to do these intelligently, we have to have understanding in order to make a decision which results in policy, which is generally based on incentives to do the right thing. And then that results in investments and then the transformation that we need in the world's largest industry. So we're 85% fossil now from burning hydrocarbon fuels, carbon fuels including coal, need to get to 100% renewables, perhaps nuclear, quickly, prudently, and I mean based on good engineering and good business decisions and profitably. Capital, a large amount of capital must be formed and deployed and it won't be attracted unless it can be done so profitably. So we need to recognize that our species has become the most powerful on the earth, the Anthropocene epoch as Paul Crutzen called it. And we have become in fact the planet managers. We are so powerful. So we need to put on our planet managers hats <laughs> and begin to accept responsibility for that. So chapter one, operating manual for spaceship Earth. Arrhenius, back before 1900, proved that, hydro that uh, CO2 is a heat trapping gas and he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for it. This is the greenhouse effect. We understand that radiant energy from the sun in the visible spectrum hits the surface of the Earth, it heats it up, infrared tries to escape, and the uh, greenhouse gases block that. 
CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. CH4, methane, is about 30 to 80 times as effective per molecule in trapping heat in the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide generally results from explosives and the excessive use of nitrogen fertilizer. So the mining operations and the road building operations around here are putting very high global warming impact gases into the air. The global gases, greenhouse gases, are these. And here's where they come from. A lot of it from our energy supply and transport. A lot of it is from cement manufacture. And here are the, the sources in our human system for where it comes from. Now, every gallon of gasoline that we burn, and we have one here, of course, is, uh, weighs about seven and a half pounds and puts 20 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that's where these eight, 10, 15 billion tons of CO2 that humanity emits to the atmosphere every year come from. Now, how can seven pounds of gasoline result in 20 pounds of CO2? It's the mass of the, carbon, of, the hydrogen, of the oxygen atoms that we add to the carbon atom and oxidizing it to release it as CO2. Very accurate data for over 40 years now of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. It's so accurate that you can see the seasonal fluctuations as the foliage in the northern hemisphere grows and dies back. The problem is that it's accelerating. 350.org, Bill McKibben's organization, was motivated by crossing the 350 line, which many climate scientists say is the line we dare not cross, because that may cause us to raise the average global surface temperature by over 2 degrees C, and that might result in irreversible consequences. We were there when 350.org was formed, and now we're at 400 parts per million. We need to get below 350. The problem is that we are accelerating in the opposite direction. This is a thousand years of history. This is 160,000. You can see there have been climate variations. The last ice age was here, but look at the slope of what's happened lately. This is the effect of human combustion and fossil fuels. And this is our industrial revolution. This is how our emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere has increased year by year. And consequently, 10 billion tons of CO2 emissions per year from fossil fuel and cement. And here are the regions where it comes from, a lot of it from Canada, the US, OECD, and China. So we need to change from this track to slow down to a new scenario. We need to turn the curve here, a stabilization target. If we don't, we may see a sea level rise of six meters, 18 feet by the end of the century. No one knows. We know that sea level now is rising about three millimeters per year, and that that rate of increase is, the rate of rise is increasing. We have no idea what sea level is going to be like in the year 2100. If it looks like this, there will be millions of environmental refugees in this country as well as many other countries. How will we accommodate them? Sea level rise happens is most dangerous because of the large amount of ice that's trapped on land in the glaciers that we have here in southeast Alaska and elsewhere and in, in Antarctica and in Greenland. And when we have melting ice cubes in the water, and then, you want to hold that, Mark? And then we add terrestrial ice. If there's a uh, ice shelf in Antarctica melting, it doesn't raise the level of the water at all. But if more ice starts falling into the sea off the continent of Greenland, or off the island of Greenland, the, con the continent of Antarctica, then it begins overflowing the bathtub and sea level rises. Thank you. Sorry, K2. <laughs> And the rate of increase of sea level rise is increasing. And these are the various scenarios. According to the models, we could have over 100 centimeters rise. That's 20, 20 inches of rise, 20 to 40 inches of rise by the year 2100. That would be overwhelming to many people. 
The evil twin of global warming, the other CO2 problem, is ocean acidification. The pH is going down, which means more acidic, especially right here in the Gulf, in the, the North Atlantic and in the Gulf of Alaska. Humanity's CO2 comes from mostly burning fossil fuels and a lot of it from deforestation, burning forests. And a lot of it winds up in the oceans, and that's where the acidification comes from. The problem is that the little creatures who require aragonite, which is a form of calcium carbonate to make their shells, don't have that supply anymore, and they can't use it to fix their shells. Energy is so important to us because we are very weak. And the obvious way to multiply our effectiveness is to capture some people and make them work for us for free. We've decided morally that that's not acceptable to most of us. And then we get beasts of burden. And now today, in our modern society, we have the equivalent of a very large number of energy slaves working for us 24-7. So here our champion, Nibali, who won the uh, Tour de France last year, has a peak power output, probably, no one knows for sure, but these super bikers can put out 500 watts, two-thirds of a horsepower for a short period of time, average 250. So this guy is making three kilowatt hours per day if he rides for 12 hours. How much energy is that? Well, that means in this country we have the effect, the, the, the energy output of 35 of these energy slaves working for us 24-7, every man, woman, and child. Now a kilowatt hour is 2.6 million foot-pounds. That's what we buy at the electric meter from our local electric power company. If you hired a Sherpa to carry your 100-pound pack from 3,000 feet to the top of Everest, that would be an elevation change of 26,000 feet times 100 pounds, would be 2.6 million foot-pounds. That's the definition of one kilowatt hour for which we pay 12 cents. So we pay 12 cents, and it would take a Sherpa about a week to do that for you. So that's one Sherpa week of effort for which we pay about 12 cents. And some humans command a very large amount of energy in the course of doing their, their work. So chapter two, operating manual for Spaceship Earth. Now Madden, when he retired as head coach of the Oakland Raiders at age 42 in 1979, said, the most difficult part of my job in recruiting coaches and finding really good ball players is finding them who have toughness. Now he said toughness is the ability to see what you don't want to see, hear what you don't want to hear, and do what you don't want to do with enthusiasm. That's toughness, that's what I look for. So we're gonna leave here as climate change toughs, not environmentalist wimps, because we're gonna look at the hard facts of what we're doing. Remember the seventh generation? There was more to it. We don't often hear the complete quotation even if it requires having skin as thick as the bark of a pine. So we're gonna put on our thick skins and see the nature of this ecological footprint that we humans are now afflicting upon the planet, effectively consuming at the rate that 1.5 Earths would be necessary for, to satisfy our demand. And we don't have 1.5 Earths, so we're depleting it. World energy in 06 is almost entirely fossil fuel, coal, natural gas, and oil. In 2030, it's even more coal, natural gas, and oil. How in the world are we going to reduce the rate at which we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere in this scenario? This is why nothing less than transforming the world's largest energy will be necessary. The developed countries have pretty well peaked and leveled off in their total use of energy while the rest of the world is still increasing. This is from the BP Energy Outlook out to 2035. Look, this is the energy future that we're expecting to see. Not much of it is renewable or hydro or even nuclear. Still, mostly, even in 2035, fossil fuel. In billions of tons of oil, and this is where it's going, primary energy consumption for since 2000, we've been putting together these spaghetti charts, trying to analyze our energy economy at the world and at the national level. We've gotten better at it. Here's 09 for the USA. 95 quadrillion BTU, that's just a way of measuring a very large quantity of energy. Almost all of it from oil, coal, and natural gas. Biomass, what's that doing in there? 
That's corn ethanol to go to gasoline fuel. Here's the way we use electricity in this country, a lot of it for HVAC. You don't see any for transportation here. The electric cars really haven't arrived. 2013, picture is very much the same, about the same amount of ethanol. 2025, we're going to be using more energy. We'd leveled off there a few years, now more energy in 2025, again, primarily from fossil fuels. Look at nuclear and look at renewables. The total of renewables is almost insignificant. We've got to do better than that, and we can. Remember the Jacobson and DeLucci paper said there's enough renewable source energy if we decide to use it to run the whole country for all energy for all purposes. Carbon emissions, well, they come from the three fossil fuels, of course. And not very efficient electricity generation. By 2030, it's up to 8 billion tons of CO2 per year, primarily from fossil fuels. 2050, we're going to have more population in this country. That'll put it up even further. And in 2040, Shell, in their visionary way, their Shell scenarios say, two-thirds of our energy is going to be served by hydrocarbons. We probably can't do that. We have to decide to do things differently. Now, what if we use carbon capture and sequestration at all of our coal-fired plants, our electric generating plants, to grab the CO2 and put it into the ground? That improves the picture a little bit, but not much, and it's very expensive. Nuclear doesn't look much better either. China is going to be the big increase in nuclear energy, but still it's a small part of the overall picture. The climate scientists say we dare not exceed two degrees average global temperature rise without reaching a tipping point, a positive feedback, and perhaps runaway climate change. Are we there? A paper from the uh, UK said, we dare not burn two-thirds of the reserves of oil, gas, and coal that we already know exist without exceeding that two degree C limit. So why are the oil companies, for example, spending billions of dollars searching for new reserves that can be produced and delivered when we can't burn two-thirds of what we already know is there? and is available to us. But some say that two degrees C limit is deception and it's impossible to achieve anyway, so why are we wasting any time talking about it? One eighth of the world's coal is in Alaska. We need to keep it in the ground. Alaska Conservation primary uh, campaign now is to help keep Alaska's coal in the ground. Look at Alaska's energy economy. Look at all the natural gas we use, but it goes to industrial. And a lot of the petroleum goes to industrial. That's the North Slope and the pipeline. We use a lot of natural gas to run the compressors to run, to run taps, not particularly to run us. We have a little hydro, but it's a rather insignificant part of Alaska's energy economy. Juno's energy economy. Look, this is about, uh, this is heating oil, this is highway gasoline. This is electricity and this is various other things. But if we, that's our internal energy economy, that which we can measure that flows into the community and we use here. If we add the external energy economy, this huge blue sector is cruise ship fuel. Now it's not fair to allocate all the cruise ship fuel to Juno because the ships stop at other places, but if they didn't burn that amount of fuel, they wouldn't get to Juno. So we allocate it to Juno. So the biggest effect, if we combine local and external effects, uh, the other external effects, of course, are Alaska Airlines fuel, Alaska Marine Highway System, and barge fuel, none of which is bought, very little of which is bought in Juneau. Then this is the total energy economy to maintain this city of 32,000 people 900 miles from anywhere. We may be the most energy inefficient planet, uh, place on the planet. So our components, AELP in 07, before they got the Lake Dorothy plant, now in 2015, this is our total internal energy, add the external, this is Juno's total energy consumption to operate Juno as we know it. What are our opportunities and our obligations here? Could we be a laboratory city to demonstrate a kind of energy use and energy efficiency that we haven't seen in the, in the state yet? In the uh, Juno Economic Development Council, we have a renewable energy cluster industry. I'm one of the co-chairs of that group that's trying to 
form a renewable energy cluster industry here. And in Alaska, we have more renewable energy than we have oil and gas. How can we get that marketed? It's all stranded. There's no way to get it to market. But the Japanese have an idea. We may be able to do that. So making our decision. Now, the Obama administration has said these are the new targets for reducing our CO2 emissions. They are brave targets, but they may be inadequate to do what we need to do to completely change the CO2 profile of our emissions. Fortunately, there's an enormous amount of renewable source energy available to us offshore and onshore. Alaska, the wind, one of the windiest places in the world. Hydro and geothermal in Alaska, various different kinds. Biological, photobiological, biomass, even in Alaska, even in southeast where we have a lot of wood. PV and very large solar concentrating plants. Sunlight has now become affordable as a replacement for electricity. Very large solar plants and even more imagined for the vast open spaces of western China. We have more coastline than the rest of the country put together for wave and tidal and current, wave generation, OTEC. And if we could access the deep geothermal energy, that could be as close to a silver bullet as we're going to find. Now, if we can harvest the thermal energy from a cube of deep rock only 10 kilometers on a side, that's enough energy to supply all of humanity, all energy for all purposes. If we could just access that deep geothermal, if we could afford to bore that deep in the ground. And a consortium from Norway, uh, Switzerland, and Russia has figured out perhaps a way of doing that. Rather than grinding your way into the ground as we do now with rotary abrasive drill bits, they would use very high energy electric sparks to blast the rock apart and bore their way into the, into the ground by electric pulse boring. Nuclear may see a renaissance, not the kinds of plants that we have seen before like Three Mile Island, but small modular reactors that can be built in factories and delivered on, to site on big trucks and would be more safe inherently than the kinds of nuclear plants that we're accustomed to. And nuclear fusion, always 40 years in the future, if we could just bottle starlight, that might be the way to run this for a very long time with a sustainable, benign energy system at the global level. How are we going to do that? Well, you and I in this room are the trim tab on the rudder of this vast thing called USA energy and, and global energy. We need to quickly make this, trans this transformation profitably and by appropriate policy. There's a better way to do it than the way we have been doing it. And so new paradigms are needed. We have to think beyond electricity as we're doing with this whole, you notice our perpetual motion machine quit over here. <laughs> it ran out of hydrogen fuel. But there was no wire, there's no transmission wire in there. We're using a hydrogen pipeline to move the energy around. Power to gas when there's excess renewable source electricity, make hydrogen and stick it into the natural gas pipeline system. We need to think in complete renewable energy systems, not just adjuncts to the electricity system as we now know it, but from photons and moving air and water molecules to delivered energy services. The, the outgoing chair, uh, president of Duke Energy said, uh-oh, if everybody gets rooftop PV and a battery, we, the electric utility industry, are out of business. We're just in the backup business. So the whole electric utility industry is feeling a great threat from this distributed energy. Right here in, in uh, Juneau this last year, Alaskans are asking the governor for a climate change task force to deal far beyond what we can do in this room in this hour at the state level. And part of it would be courting the Japanese who have figured out a way of moving our renewable source stranded energy to Japan. John Neary has taken on the task of transforming the Glip Visitor Center into a climate change education center. Here at the Juno Economic Development Council with money from the Forest Service, here are our action initiatives for our renewable energy cluster working group, encouraging electric car transportation with charging stations, a district heating system, perhaps beginning with the Willoughby district, 
in education and outreach that John Neary is doing so well. Sokolow from, from uh, Princeton said, don't try to eat the elephant in one bite. Let's take seven different bites and try to reduce the trajectory of 14 billion tons of carbon per year by doing seven different things to reduce that effect. And these are the seven different things. Efficiency is work out over energy in. The efficiency of light bulbs has improved greatly. Now we favor LEDs that are about 80% efficient. An incandescent light bulb is about 0.04, 4% efficient. <laughs> so great improvements in efficiency. Remember, that's the technical term. And then, as we invest in more and more efficiency, according to policy, now this is New York and California who have stabilized their use of electric energy via policy and the incentives that go with it while the rest of the country is marching on up ahead. Investments in using state revenue or the absence of state revenue to achieve energy efficiency and then induce people to invest until they reach the point at which the energy they're saving equals the cost of the energy that they have to buy. And finally, conservation is the human choice. If the technical is available to you, how you choose to operate your lifestyle. We also need to consider embodied energy. How many thousands of gallons of diesel fuel was burned and how much explosive was used to pulverize the rock in order to build, for example, the Sunny Point intersection? And how many years or centuries will it take us of saving energy by not having to stop at a stoplight here to pay back that embodied energy that was invested in order to build this thing for us in the, in the first place? For example, the, the extension of the road, the widening of the road, there's a lot of blasting and a lot of diesel fuel going on. The extension of a road connection north of town would, it would require a very large amount of embodied energy, which is not reckoned in the EIS that the uh, uh, dot buff provides for us. What about the uh, Susitna Watana Dam? How much embodied energy would be necessary in the concrete to build that dam? And how many decades or centuries would it take us to earn back that amount of embodied energy and the renewable energy that we generate in the dam? We need to reckon that. We have to have a dam because this is the, the uh, flow profile going through the, through the Susitna River. This is our house on Gaston Avenue. Over 200 yards of concrete went into that building. We didn't think about it at the time. We didn't think about embodied energy, but how much energy was dissipated and CO2 poured into the atmosphere to make that amount of concrete so that we can sit there facing southwest and, and gather some, uh, some sunlight. This is a different structure, one I built as an experiment a few years ago. This is only one centimeter thick. This has a third of a yard of concrete. If you made it big enough for humans, six meters in diameter, maybe one yard of concrete for a complete house for people. That's reducing embodied energy. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this transformation? Are we going to wait for a silver bullet in technology or the deus ex machina as the Greeks had it? No, we need to invest in efficiency, conservation, move from fossils to renewables, perhaps nuclear, and we need to get the economics right. We need to price energy so that it includes these external costs. And that's generally done by taxing or untaxing, including uh, incentives. And the whole system has to be operated profitably. We can't have government doing things. We have to have capital flow and capital will flow where it can make a profit. And that results in policy. Human population is always going to be one of our great challenges. There's just so many of us on Earth all trying to live like Americans and we're using Earth at the rate of one and a half Earths. It's not sustainable. And finally, the whole thing is a spiritual and moral challenge, more than a technical and engineering challenge. We have the technology. The technology is getting better. We can afford to do this. First, we need to agree on a goal and understand that it's going to be an enormous task, but an enormous business opportunity. $45 trillion will be spent worldwide in the next 15 to 20 years on energy infrastructure alone. That is going to put a lot of people to work if they're well enough trained to do it. And if we can also unite humanity in the process, 
After all, didn't science fiction always teach us if that there was an asteroid or an alien invasion that would unite the human race and we would respond? Uh, isn't it time to do that? And myth is important too. As Joseph Campbell asked, what myth are we living? We might be trying to live the wrong myth. What can we do in Juneau? What's our economy look like? Well, electric transit, we're, we're encouraging. The cruise ship industry needs certain things from the community and it's willing to pay for it by the passenger tax. We should probably not expand the community to West Douglas, enticing people to drive more and burn more gasoline. John Neary is going to transform the visitor center for us. We can put in district heating systems, which will be much more efficient, both economically and thermally, than every one of us having his own heating system in his house. Are we going to prepare to accept some climate refugees? After all, we're on an elevator. We're going up a centimeter a year while sea level is rising three millimeters a year. We're gaining land. When people start boiling out of Florida looking for a place to live, maybe we should accept them here. We should become Alaska's laboratory city. Maybe that's the best way of anchoring the uh, capital here. The energy economy is going to require the equivalent of 45 trillion in U.S. investment in new infrastructure, whether it's transmission lines or generating plants or PV systems, by about the year 2030. That's a huge business opportunity worldwide. And here's where it's going to go. Not so much in the USA. Our energy is tapered off. It's going to go in these growing parts of the world. That's where the big investments are going to be made. Well, there's a better way to do it. We've looked at this. People do not want these things in their backyards. They'll fight them for decades. And so maybe we should be moving our renewable energy around in hydrogen pipelines, as I showed you here. That little rubber pipeline was a hydrogen pipeline and was moving money or moving energy all the way around here, having made it over here in the electrolyzer and then delivered it in the fuel cell. Now, it doesn't make any sense to start gathering energy from wind and solar throughout this really windy and sunny part in a hydrogen pipeline, hydrogen transmission pipeline, shipping it to Texas, by the way, because that's where you can afford to put very large storage caverns in domal salt formations that are abundant along the Gulf of Mexico coast. You can store energy really inexpensively as hydrogen in caverns. And then to build pipelines to the major markets from this backbone pipeline. Does that make any economic and technical sense? We don't know. We haven't done the study. And I'll be going to the American Wind Energy Association conference in a week, trying to get them to agree that at least we ought to put together a collaborative to study this as an option. That rather than trying to do everything with electricity, maybe barking up the wrong tree or trying to put a square peg in a round hole, we should consider hydrogen systems. In Europe, they're putting renewable source hydrogen into the natural gas transmission pipeline, delivering a mixed gas, hydrogen and methane. The problem is that in northern Germany, they have so much more wind energy than the electricity demand, they have to turn off the wind generators and waste all that wind. Now they're putting in these hydrogen generating plants so they can dump it into the natural gas pipeline system. Free transmission, free storage. And here's what one looks like. This is a hydrogen electrolyzer plant, two megawatt scale, power to gas, electric power to natural gas. The car companies are bringing the hydrogen fuel vehicles. And Toyota has said, we're not building a battery, EV, a battery electric vehicle. We're not going to bother because they're only short range vehicles. They're about a 100 mile range, unless you can afford a Tesla. And it takes three or four or six hours to charge the battery. It takes three minutes to recharge, to refuel one of these cars. Hondas will be out next year. Here's the Hyundai Tucson. These are hydrogen fueled only. These are not hybrid cars, except they do have the battery on for, for, uh, for the very high demand. Okay. And Mercedes has also said, no, the CEO has said, no one's going to make money on electric cars in a reasonable time, except maybe Tesla and Elon Musk. But it's a very small market segment. And even Mercedes is interested in a much, more, much larger segment than, uh, than Tesla will be able to find. Riding in the rain, this is the slide we used at the Glacier Visitor Center. Rain provides hydroelectric energy from which we can make hydrogen, from which we can operate our city buses and our cars as well. So here's Elon Musk, who has, has nothing kind to say about hydrogen. 
But his cars have about 1,000 pounds of batteries aboard, have about a 300 mile range, cost a lot of money, and takes three or four or six hours to charge. These are available now, and some of them are driving around now. But in California, where the greenhouse gas goal is that they are 80% below 1990 levels, you cannot get there with battery electrics. You must use fuel cell vehicles perhaps in addition to battery electric vehicles to get there. So the hydrogen fuel cars, maybe at last the hydrogen economy or a hydrogen sector of the economy is coming. Now back to Alaska, let's look at the earth from the northern regions. What if we use natural gas at the north slope, converted it to electricity and shipped it down to our rail built communities, our, our big demand here. And we could do that if we had solid oxide fuel cells on the North Slope using natural gas that comes out of the oil and gas reservoirs. When you produce oil, you produce gas as well. It's called produced gas. So set, send the oil down taps, send the natural gas over here to the fuel cell generating plant. The CO2 you capture and put all of it back down in the oil reservoir. So there's no CO2 emission. And this is used for enhanced oil recovery. Then we make electricity and we send it to Fairbanks and Anchorage on a new high voltage DC transmission line. This is what those fuel cells look like. They can be stored outdoors. They'll operate at minus 40 degrees C. And then we use these organic ranking cycle for what they call the bottoming cycle to improve the efficiency. Remember efficiency is important as well as conservation. We improve the efficiency of the whole plant. So we could run the rail belt with just a couple of converter stations, we convert to DC and then we have a converter station in Fairbanks feeding this area and one down here feeding the Kenai. We can do this, the technology is available now. Why aren't we doing that? Rather than billing, bringing big drill rigs into the small communities to try to access geothermal energy, we just can't do that in small communities, it's too expensive. Let's see if we can help mature this electric pulse boring so you bring in a relatively light piece of equipment. One hole in the ground will power the complete city of Angoon and many of other, our other smaller communities with both electricity and thermal energy using this new method of accessing to the ground called electric pulse boring where we use a single hole to access the very hot energy. Nine kilometers down is 300 degrees C. That could be the, the silver bullet for energy. Now the Japanese, when they look out at the world, see Russia, of course, and Korea and, and Japan, but they see that Alaska is very close and it's very windy here. How can we get the renewable energy of Alaska to Japan? There are three ways, and they're working on all three of them. All three of them bring hydrogen-rich liquid fuels with zero carbon emissions, if they are from renewable sources, to Japan where they would then use them for transportation fuel. So this is a way that we could access floating wind turbines. This is uh, geothermal energy at one of the islands in Japan. Kawasaki is in charge of liquid hydrogen tankers. We can even operate aircraft on hydrogen fuel. And ammonia is also an attractive hydrogen rich molecule, a way of moving liquid hydrogen liquid fuel, very hydrogen rich around the world on cryogenic tankers. These are commodity tankers. This is the way we put propane around the world. And there's 140 million tons a year of, of uh, economic movement of, of ammonia right now. Chioda has said the hydrogen rich molecule is methyl cyclohexane. And they've, they've called it spira hydrogen. Spira is Latin for uh, uh, hope. Hope, hope hydrogen, how's that for branding? So this is the way it works. You send a tanker to Southeast Alaska or Alaska to pick up renewable source hydrogen. You change the toluene molecule, C7H8, into methyl cyclohexane, send the same tanker back to the waterfront in Tokyo where they offload it, take the hydrogen off that molecule, you're back to uh, uh, toluene and send it back in the tanker. So it's a loop of bringing hydrogen rich molecules. Now, if all else fails, maybe the better way to do it is geoengineering. And that means putting particles in the atmosphere, orbiting mirrors, clouds to reflect more sunlight back into space, 
fertilized in the ocean with, with iron so that the, the foraminifera will, will bloom and capture more CO2 and sequester it at the bottom of the ocean. Very risky business. We probably don't want to do that. What if we do have millions of environmental refugees to take care of? What about a city based entirely upon public transportation with no cars, no private car transportation anywhere in the community? You park your car out here at the parking lot. This is something I came up when I was in grad school in 1969. This is what it would look like. In Juneau, we could have a fixed guideway electric powered transit system. We need to make a decision. Desisio, to cut away, why is it so difficult for us to do that? These are grave dangers. Why are we so slow at this? Shall we begin with a carbon tax to discipline ourselves to do the right thing? What else do we need to know? What haven't I covered today? Well, it's a very big topic. We can't cover it all. And what are Juno's and Alaska's opportunities as well as responsibilities? Back to Arrhenius. In 1895, he proved that CO2 is a carbon, CO2 is a heat trapping gas. No one has refuted that. The measurements of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere are extremely precise and reliable. Nobody argues about that. We're putting too much CO2 too fast into the atmosphere. We stopped an oncoming ice age, but we've gone far beyond that. We're in overshoot mode now. So are we barking up the wrong tree and trying to do everything with renewable source electricity? This is just a mistake. If you're barking at a, something dangerous up there, like continued climate change, that could be very expensive <laughs> if that comes back to bite you. Or are we trying to put a square peg in a round hole in some of the technology that we're using? If you're in the electricity, renewable electricity business from wind or solar, the world looks like wires. If your only product is electricity, the world looks like wires. But we know that we can move that energy around in hydrogen systems as well. Aldo Leopold, the father of the modern environmental movement, said, there are two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. This is not just a technical and economic problem. Spiritual dangers, supposing that breakfast comes from the grocery and that heat comes from the furnace. So are we some sort of favored species that will not be allowed to fail, or do we have some responsibility to take care Organic wholeness, as Jeffers said, love that, not man, apart from that. We can do it, but we have to make a decision based on understanding to do it. Thank you. Is there a rush for questions? No one is rushing up. You have to go to the mic. That's the, that's the rule here. You have to go talk into the mic. I don't know if I can get there. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Let's get out in the sunshine. With an estimate rise, uh, I've read of the oceans of six meters by the end of the century, how much of Juno will be underwater? That's a very good question that could be answered graphically, couldn't it? Because we know that Juno's rising at a centimeter a year. Bruce is going to do that for us. Get, get, get together with Bruce Simonson. He loves to do problems like that. But no one knows whether we're going to have that six meter sea level rise. But at six meters, I think the answer is a lot, a lot of Juno's. Sir. So earlier today, I toured uh, one of the uh, newest buildings in Juneau, if not the newest. Uh, it's a lead building, which I believe means that it's energy efficient. They were very proud of this, and they proudly showed us their uh, burn, uh, bur pellet burners in the basement, um, telling us that they don't actually use electricity to heat the building. They use wood. I just wonder what you have to say about lead and, and that. D depends on where the wood comes from, to some extent. <laughs> Lead buildings are always good, and you know there are three grades of lead. There's silver, gold, and platinum, which has to do with not only the energy efficiency of the building, but the way it uses water, it conserves uh, resources, and whether the resources the building is made from were, were recycled and recyclable. We at the uh, Renewable Energy Cluster Working Group have an, uh, an incentive 
program, uh, one of our objectives is to bring more locally produced wood to market. But building a pellet plant in southeast Alaska is just too small a market. And so most of these pellets come from BC. So it's not a particularly good idea to spend the energy to bring pellets all that distance. So until we have a big enough market so we can have our own pellet plant, uh, it's, it's an improvement, but it might be a marginal one. Elaine. Um, our western uh, coast neighbors, uh, some of them are looking at carbon tax and dividends to the public or to education. So as we know, BC has a carbon tax already that's been working and Washington and Oregon are contemplating a carbon tax. And I was wondering what you think about the possibility of a carbon tax in Alaska because we are used to having dividends <laughs> and the public could receive a carbon tax dividend. What do you think of that? The, the trick, the key seems to be to make it revenue neutral. We'll pay more carbon tax for our hydrocarbons that we use and burn but we'll get the money back and reduce employment taxes, reduce sales taxes or other forms so that for everybody, ideally, it's revenue neutral. We don't end up paying more tax, but we discourage the behavior that we don't want. Tom. Well, as a follow-up to that, I, the, the economic and the moral issues are probably as important as the technical issues. Um, you know, we have trouble now coming up with the money to cover people with health care. And, uh, and the political will to do that. But you're talking about a process that requires a lot of uh, investment. What, where's it gonna come from? Where's the money gonna come from? <laughs> I don't know, Tom. From us, we have to decide. <laughs> we are, we're finished with the TV program, but we can continue the questions as long as we want. Sir, uh, please. Yes, so I noticed you didn't talk about, um, about recycling or um, repurposement of recycled goods. Um, do you think that would that is a uh, going to play a big role in the future of um, economic or uh, environmentally economic solutions? That depends, doesn't it, <laughs> on what you do with the recycled material? In uh, is it is it Whitehorse where they're making uh, fuel from recycled plastics? That's the ideal thing to do with it. But yes. Recycling, reusing, refusing, of course, is the most important thing, but yes, recycling is an important part of it. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy wants us to get outside. <laughs>